Welcome to the podcast of MotorWeek, television's original automotive magazine. MotorWeek is made possible by Cars.com. Here's your MotorWeek podcast host, John Davis. Welcome to MotorWeek's 41st podcast. I am John Davis, and joining me around our oddly shaped desk here in Studio C. <laughs> or some oddly shaped sure folks. <laughs> or some oddly shaped folks. Our road test producer and two-wheeling reporter, Brian Robinson. Hello. And our head writer, Shami Choksi. Hello. And our over-the-edge reporter, Stephen Chupnik. Hello. Coming up, we'll have our lightning round, and our, we'll look into the MotorWeek mailbag. But first, Scion second-generation TC Sport Coupe and a captivating convertible from Alfa Romeo and a bigger, more affordable Volkswagen Wagon Jetta. All of those we'll get to in just a moment, along with something very, very special. Stephen's going to talk about the King Midget Jamboree. That's right. All right, but first to the four wheels that we know and love Scion TC Sport Coupe, Brian Robinson, all new car, but is it? Yeah, I just got back from uh, San Diego at the press launch of that, and uh, it is all new, but uh, it's barely different than before, which uh, it's probably a good thing for the Scion TC. I think all of its buyers were very happy with the current one. Uh, they just wanted a little more power, a little more performance overall, and uh, I think they've given them that. You, is it? You know, the pictures make it hard to distinguish in appearance. In person, it, you can definitely see it's a little more chiseled, a little more chunky looking, but uh, overall, the overall shape and that length and height are exactly the same. The width is just a little bit wider. Why? Got, I mean, why do you think they they Pretty much preserved that look. I mean, it's an all-new car, but they've kept the visuals the same. Well, way. it's similar to like a Ford Mustang. I mean, it's they got a very enthusiastic buyers that they you know they buy a Ford Mustang because they want a Ford Mustang, and right. they don't care if it's a little bit different or a lot different. Right. They want a more performance, which has got a new uh, 2.5 liter engine. Right. It's up to 180 horse and uh, two new six speeds, manual and automatic, and uh, it's a fun little car. I think the uh, so it's more fun than before. Oh, uh, it's barely more fun. I mean, right. it's a little more performance, uh -huh. but it still has the same you know fun factor to it. Right? Are some of the newer electronics inside the car? Yeah, it's got uh, you know steering wheel control standard for the radio, and uh, you know it's made for mid twenties youth market that everyone's after. So it's got some really uh, jamming stereos. The base stereo is is an improved version of the stereo from the Lexus LX570, oh, wow. their best stereo. So uh, it's got plenty of uh, high-tech goodies. The, you know, we always hear the term driver-focused interior in this industry, and it's kind of taken to an extreme here. Everything's uh, kind of around the driver. All the controls are extremely tilted to the driver. And then the passenger has a lot more room. It's almost, uh, it's if you sit in the passenger and the driver's seat, it's a totally different experience. So they, that's that's a much bigger change than the exterior. Yeah, yeah. The, 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 even the seats themselves are different between the driver and the passenger. The passenger's wider, and the whole area over there is more comfortable. And this is their most popular model, so it's important. The TC, yes. And it's also the youngest uh, average age buyer of any car in the automotive industry with an average age of 26. Wow. But uh, And the, the rear seat... Uh, you know, obviously, if you're a young 26-year-old guy that has a jamming car with a jamming stereo, you're going to have lots of friends. So uh, the rear seat, it's easy to get in and out of for me. I, I'm six foot, and, um, you know, there's enough, plenty of leg room, head room. It's obviously a little tight, but uh, it's a fun little car. I, I mean, I have full disclosure. I have a Toyota Celica, and this is kind of the, you know, kind of the... Uh, extension of that car. It's not called a Celica anymore. Kind of a replacement similar, for it. Yeah, yeah, similar car. and uh, You know, little two-door semi-sporty coupes are fun. It's got the, similar to CRZ, it's kind of got the, the glass is on the side and the windshield. It's got blacked out A-pillars, so it's kind of made to look like a pair of, like, wraparound shades or, mm -hmm. or a helmet. You can, you know, if you vision a helmet from the side with a visor, that's kind of what they were kind of styling it. So you happens. liked it? I did. It's a fun car. You know, uh, it's obviously pricing in this market is really important, especially if you're going after young buyers. So, uh, you know, it starts at around 19, which, uh, you know, that's it's a little a, high. That's about a grand higher than it was before, I think. Yeah, but compared to to a lot of other cars out there, uh, like Mazda 3, uh, you know, it's, it's I would say, as fun, if not more fun. Mm -hmm. Speaking of fun... And this is my new, if I won the uh, lottery, uh, big lottery car, 
Um, we had a chance to um, test the Alfa Romeo 8C Spider, and for people that don't really know what that is, uh, this is a very Google it's a very rare car. There's only 500 of them were brought into the U.S. It's the convertible version of the 8C uh, Competizione Coupe, uh, which was also one of the most stunning cars we've ever had here at Motor Week. Actually, John, uh, I'm sorry, only, only 500 were yeah. made. Uh, oh, 500 were made. Yeah, yeah. Less, oh, than less, than, less than 50 yeah. came to the U.S. Thanks very much for that. But uh, compared to the Coupe, it has the same um, Ferrari-based uh, V8 engine, uh, 444 horse- horsepower couple hundred pounds more weight just a spectacular car and with that i'll see what you all thought of it yeah it's perfectly balanced i mean it's based on maserati underpinning so that starts off the whole well thing. maserati ferrari and alpha of course yeah, are, yeah. are our it's all big one italian Fiat. love yeah. fest yeah. yeah it really is but this car is sort of uh, i mean when you know when we think about italian uh um, roadsters. Uh, we, we're always thinking about Ferrari, Lamborghini. We, we don't think about Alfa Romeo here. I mean, well, they, they've been out of this market for a long yeah, time. Yeah, back about a decade and a half. But uh, man, is, this car is just a stunner. I mean, uh, forget about the way it drives. I'll let Brian talk about that. But uh, just looking at it from the outside, it just kind of blows your mind. It's beautiful. It, it was awesome to drive. But if I owned it, I would just sit in my garage and start the thing up every day. I mean, it <laughs> sounds so cool. It has a real yeah. burbling exhaust. Yeah. Yeah. Something that's but, almost uh, gone just away. Pops and, and gurgles. Pops yeah. and hisses and yeah. gurgles yeah. and yeah. makes you just feel like, oh, it's really, it's alive. But for a three hundred thousand dollars supercar, I mean, it was it was fairly easy to drive. I would say not as easy as uh, like an R eight V ten. I mean, that car mm-hmm. to me is like the easiest to drive supercar ever. But uh, this one's pretty close, and the you know it's got the F one style gearbox. Which uh, continues to improve. I mean, when we do uh, driving shots in the car, you know, we're constantly going back and forth, turn, doing three port turns and blind corners, and it's always a nerve wracking experience. With especially with those sequential manuals, sometimes they don't want to go in and out of gear fast, but uh, it worked really well. I was really impressed with it. Uh, last year we drove the AC Competizione. Mm-hmm. Um, that was the coupe version of it, and just just as a comparison, uh, that one felt a little bit more like a race car. This one has a sort of a mellower it's feel. A little softer sprung. It is. Yeah. It is. Uh, not to say that it's more of a showboat, but yeah, it, it's a little bit more of a, a grand tour, if yeah. you want to call it. That. It was a little softer, yeah, definitely yeah. in the cornering, but yeah. uh, still, still very and. Uh, Lots of uh, exposed carbon fiber throughout the interior, yeah. and you open the trunk, and uh, which is almost uh, non-existent uh, storage-wise. But you open the you know the inside of the trunk's all carbon fiber. I mean, it's it's a trick piece. Yeah. So, Stephen Chupnik, I saw you drooling over it. Any comments? Uh, well, I, I mean, you were talking about the the sound, and that's the first thing you notice is you turn you well, you don't even turn the motor, you hit the motor, yeah, and that's uh, and it. It just sounds like it a car. It sounds Italian. It sounds more than a car. It sounds yeah. like something. It's a shame no one will ever get to really drive it. <laughs> <laughs> okay, let's pull everybody back down to earth now. And a very real car that they are, the maker is expecting to sell lots and lots and lots of in America. And that is the all-new Volkswagen Jetta. Brian Robinson, I'll let you start off again with that. Yeah, you said it right at the beginning, uh, bigger, more affordable. Uh, that's pretty much the key to the new Jetta. Uh, it's been totally redone, and they wanted to bring the price down so it's more in line with uh, Civic and Corolla. They think they don't get cross shopped enough with those two, and Volkswagen's got big plans for the U.S. market, especially with this car. They want to take more sales from those two. But uh, it's gotten a lot bigger, uh, both exterior and interior. The uh, interior room is huge, especially the rear seat room. It's got best, I think it's best in class best rear in seat class. room. Best in class. It's close to like a BMW 7 Series, which and is not exactly the, the world's greatest rear seat room. But this is a com, still a compact car, so it's that's still considered something. a compact, but huh. it's barely it's barely smaller than the Passat, which I guess the new Passat's coming out in another year or so, which will be uh, even bigger. bigger. Yeah, so. But it's, uh, you know, 2 liter or 2.5 liter at launch. They got a diesel, turbo, hybrid all coming along the line. Uh, as far as the restyle, it looks a little more conservative, not quite as edgy as before. And uh, What do you think about the new front end? Because the front end has gone away from what 
I call the drop jaw look that Volkswagen and Audi have had the last few years. And it looks fairly ordinary. And my understanding is this is going to be kind of the new face of Volkswagen. Yeah. And in a world where car company, you know, some car companies are getting more extreme and some are getting more conservative. They seem to be going in the conservative route. Was it pleasant to see in person? Yeah, it looks much better in person on the pictures. Uh, it is definitely more conservative looking. The grill, I kind of like the, the new front end treatment. It's it's a little less flashy and uh, it's more almost Asian looking in that it's, it's a little more so less German looking than than before definitely. Okay, so they've taken they've taken the price down. That usually means they've taken things out. If you were comparing features or things between this car and the current Jetta, uh, what would you see that's lacking in the well, new car? Well, the biggest change uh, price-wise would be they cheapen up the rear suspension. It's no longer independent rear suspension. And Man. but as far as driving, you you don't notice it. I, I really didn't. I mean, I knew going into it that they had done that, and you know, I'm specifically looking for to to notice it. And uh, it's still it's still a fun car, much better than. Cool. How about the interior? interior? Yeah, interior materials. Uh, uh, somewhat. I mean, they still have a a good look to them. It doesn't have maybe as inviting feel to them. Mm -hmm. uh, everything's mm, a, little a little bit harder. harder a little yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. It, The car in general it just it's kind of lost a little bit of its Germanness. And uh, it doesn't seem as, as special or unique as before, but it's still a very fun car. I was, oh, I'm mm -hmm. sorry. Go I was going to no. say you were saying it's so it's it's bigger, it's more conservative looking, it's more and, American, and it's more affordable. Yeah, it was, yeah, it's more Americanized. That's and what it's yeah, it's lighter, which I'm not still not sure after talking to the engineers that I understand how, but that it got lighter, which is every car almost, even if it gets smaller, still seems to get heavier. But it actually made it lighter and uh, gets better fuel economy than before. As we well. should so note that during all the years we did this. Show, the best handling uh, cars with uh, a twist beam or solid rear axle in the world were usually Volkswagen. So they, so even though they've gone back to a, uh, a non-independent rear suspension, they have a history of being able to do that well. Yeah, and uh, as far as we're talking about the price, it starts at seventeen thousand, and uh, they kind of simplified. The buying process is only a couple different trim levels available, and uh, the car we had was an SEL. Automatic and it, you know with a sunroof and uh, keyless entry and push button start it was like twenty three mm -hmm. and change. Uh -huh. And they've got a, a diesel and a high performance version coming later. Yeah, GLI with a turbo and uh, yeah, the TDI yeah, will TDI. be out real soon. And then also a hybrid coming another year or so. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they sell a lot more of them here. Now let's move on to Stephen Chubnick, and now for something completely different. Stephen, take it away. Yeah, uh, last week I was in Milwaukee, and uh, really not Milwaukee, but the Wisconsin area, um, and uh, I attended the King Midget Jamboree. All right, now and, explain what that is and uh, what the King Midget is. You sh it's not self-explanatory. Uh, <laughs> no. Um, no. It's, I, I thought it was as soon as I heard it, um, but uh, apparently the King Midget is a 1940 to 1970 ish. They never really determined when the last year of the car was, but it's a miniature car and it is a full working street legal car. Uh, two gears plus a reverse, uh, it's two seats. And it is truly the miniature car, and and it makes you look and, like a giant. And it makes me look any. It looks any make, makes anyone look How like a giant. How small is this thing? Uh, it's about half the size of a Mini Cooper right so now. So it's a clown car. It looks like a clown <laughs> car, and there were about fifty King Midgets driving in the Lake Geneva area of of Wisconsin along the roads, and it was the funniest thing I've ever seen. But these guys absolutely <laughs> love it, and they get together. This is their the twentieth jamboree, mm. um, and it, it's it's to celebrate these two guys. It's uh, Claude Dry and Dale Orcutt, who were World War II veterans uh, in the the Civil Air Patrol, who after the World War II decided they were going to build a car and charge five hundred dollars. And mm. they built. I mean, it's it's a, the most simple car, and it's um, the first real miniature car. And it was American. Do All, most people that have them drive them to the event, or do and, they? Uh, the, most people drove it if they were in the general area. Yeah. Um, but most people put them on a trailer, and you could probably probably carry fit it on most, your back. Well, you can fit most of them in the back of any pickup truck. So really, they're, they're all over the country. All over the country. And how many were made? Uh, there's never really been a determination of how many were made or how many were are still around, but there's about a thousand that people know about that are that are right now still around, but there's no determination. 
Um, Did you get to drive one? Huh? Unfortunately, I didn't get to drive uh, it, and really, honestly, I didn't want to, to drive. <laughs> well, not not for Good safety, answer, re- not for Good safety answer. reasons, but because they're so delicate, I really, you yeah. know, I wasn't comfortable driving them. It's 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 supposed to be really simple, but it did not look very simple as I was looking. I was they're, watching these they're guys. They're cool. Drive. I had never yeah. heard of them. I'm not yeah. exactly an automotive historian, but when you said you were going there, I looked them up, and uh, yeah, they're pretty neat looking. No. No. <laughs> they are was, really cool looking, and, and it, I've seen them at a couple of events uh, out here, one or two, you know, but there'll be one or maybe two at the most, and you do look at them, and you think, how could you get into that? You know? Have you ever driven one? No, I've never driven one. I thought one. maybe you went to the original press launch. <laughs> Thanks a lot. <laughs> 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 haven't been around quite that long. No, no, no. But uh, when you look at the vehicle, you do wonder how a, a full-size adult can get yeah, in it. But this is a true family affair. I, yeah. I mean, not it, families have owned several of them, but they also... The group is like a family, and everybody yeah, helps each other out, and it's it was a really. What do they do for parts? I mean, I suppose they must be sources to have most things made. I guess most mostly there's a few guys in the club that mm-hmm. make the parts. They make their own parts and they sell them, mm-hmm. and you know everybody has like extra engines. Extra, you know, transmissions and kind of. Do thing you know like what that. they use for power? Where they got the engine from? That I don't know. I, yeah. It was never, you know, they, they kind of. Sounds like they, they they varied from car to car quite a bit. There, there were three different models. The original model uh, was a uh, Wisconsin engine, mm-hmm. um, and one, you know. Nine horsepower, you know. Nine not, not, horsepower. Yeah, it's not. <laughs> My lawnmower's got more than nine. <laughs> I was gonna say it's not a real powerful car, but you know, it goes up to about 35, 40 miles an hour, ish. You know, if you <laughs> really push it. So it sounds like fun. Glad it, you had it was a, great a lot time. of fun. A really good time. Okay, we're going to move on now to our lightning round where our Motor Week panelists have the opportunity to share their opinions on topics making headlines. We've got two minutes before we hear the bell from Michelle. <laughs> the bell from the Michelle. Bell from Michelle <laughs> for whom the to tell comes. us the time is up. Okay, here we go. Sales of traditional station wagons have been declining. <laughs> you can say that again. Uh, they especially declined in the 80s when minivans and crossovers started to come onto the scene, 80s and 90s and now 2000s. Um, with fuel efficiency a, a priority, however, automakers like Saab, Acura, Mercedes-Benz, and Cadillac are rolling out new wagons. They often call them sport wagons, and let's not forget Subaru in there. Is the family station wagon poised for a comeback? Well, I think you, I mean, it, it's listed right there. It's the higher end car makers who are making these sport wagons. And I know, you know, I pose this question out or pose this question out to our social media people and immediately people were just saying no we, you know <laughs> we you, we like the 70s style we like the the 80s but there's more fuel efficient and better drive cars but you know that's not true i mean when you take a look at the modern station wagons they have less Aerodynamic drag than any kind of crossover or SUV. They actually, I mean, look at the Subaru Outback. It's got like, a, you know, its fuel economy on the highway with the four cylinder engines uh, up to the 30. So, yeah, it's just not going to happen. Though. It's every, just not, the people just don't want to buy yeah, them. Every couple of years we go through this. Oh, the wagon's making a return or the hatchback's making a return. It's just not going to happen. I don't, I don't, yeah, you know, I don't it, care how fuel efficient they get. It's like Except for the Europe. Outback, it's just not going to happen. Even Volvo stopped making the what, right. XC70. I well, mean, they're even, not going to bring it in anymore yeah, after this year, yeah. Yeah, it just it just seems like a European thing. Yeah, know? it is. They're very popular in Europe, right? Uh, and I think there is, but I think it's Which interesting is reason enough not to buy one. <laughs> it's interesting though that Stephen sees on uh, the social networking that there may be a preconceived notion that they're somehow inferior uh, as far as driving experience and even fuel economy. When actually, they're probably. Well, most of them are built on the same chassis now as the sedan, in the case of the Acura and the Cadillac. So very interesting. I have to admit, our family is a station wagon family, and we'd love to buy uh, another one. But there's fewer and fewer out there at an affordable price. So it is becoming something of a high-end vehicle. Mm -hmm. But, uh, okay, the consensus is get get a wagon while you can because they're not going to be around for that much longer, at least not in volume. 
Except for the Outback. Hey, except for the Outback. All right, next we'll answer a question from our MotorWeek mailbag. If you have a question for us, visit at motorweek.org, and you can submit your question. And if chosen, you will receive a free pre-shrunk, pre-shrunk, one-size-fits-all MotorWeek one size T-shirt. One-size-fits-none. Yeah. One, so, no, it's, it's a big shirt. Even I can get in it. This question comes from Bert in Virginia, who got a T-shirt. He Bert. asks... Not Bert and Ernie, just Bert. <laughs> I'm planning on buying a new car soon and dread dealing with a car salesperson. I don't blame you. It either. ranks right up there with getting a root canal, so I'm told. What do I need to keep in mind when shopping on the Internet? Or is it still better to go to the showroom and deal directly with a salesperson? I've got my own opinions about that, but I'll keep them to myself for a minute. Go ahead. Start. I, I think technology today and, and the Internet today has helped a ton. And I think you do your research on the internet, you know what price you want to pay, and I think that's the bottom line. What price do you want to pay? What options do you want? Then you go to your dealer and you say, this is what I'm paying. And I think, I think unfortunately today, maybe fortunately for the consumer, the dealer's ready for that. And I think dealerships have sort of set a pseudo set price for these cars of what the bottom line they're going to pay or what they're going to charge, but I think for the consumer, you do your research on the internet and then go out and kind of try to hangle with the with the dealers. To me, mm -hmm. I know a few people that have shopped on the internet. When we're talking about shopping on the internet, we're talking about buying on the internet, right? Maybe. Maybe. I mean, you know, uh, the few people that I know that have done this have had enormous success. Uh, even our, our illustrious Ben Davis has done that several times. Uh, I just think that you have to be realistic about it. Don't be look at cars that are on the other coast that you can't go see. You do want to see the product before you buy have it. Have it checked so, out. Yeah, absolutely. And maybe if you have a buddy that's a mechanic or something to go if with you. If it's a used car, I guess. Yeah. yeah. Yep. I just kind of just went through this. My sister just bought uh, a new car, and you know I'm getting calls from her every day. Well, this guy's saying this, and this guy's saying that. So it, she dealt a lot with the internet, but then she would get what she thought was a price, and then actually go see the guy, and all of a sudden everything changes. So I mean, a lot of New car dealers are still, you know, pulling old tricks. Yeah, exactly. They'll they'll pull, try to pull one over you on the internet instead yeah. of face to face now. But like like uh, Stephen said, use the uh, the internet mainly for your research. Figure out what you want to pay, and then you know I'd use the internet to work dealers against each other. Say hey, I got this price from this guy, this price from that guy, and then uh, then actually when you get someone to commit to a price, print it out and take it in and go to work. You still got to know what the, whether you like the car or not. And if you, I have bought and sold several cars cars, used cars on the internet and had good experiences all the way around, dealt with good dealers, set the price before I went there, got there and didn't have a problem. Uh, however, you know, that's not always the case. You've got to know the car, though. If, if you're going to go buy it on the internet, make sure you've gone to, let's say, your auto show when it comes around in the area uh, once during the winter time, and make get in it. Go to the car mm -hmm. dealer, go to the showroom on the floor of the auto show, and get in the car. Or wait for a big tent sale where you're one of uh, 50 or 100 people there, and you can sort of inconspicuously get in the car. And when you do deal with a dealer over the internet, print everything out yeah, if you've got definitely. a price from them. Take it in and show them what they said. And remember, there's another dealer across town who will probably match that. I do think the internet has taken a lot of the hassle out of buying a car. If you still want the very cheapest price, however, you've got to do it in person. So if you're going to do it over the internet, it actually forces you to be a little more reasonable and let the dealer make a little more money. And the offshoot is you have less hassle. So my experience says internet buying is less hassle. It may not get you the absolutely best price, but it'll get you a good price and you can sleep at night. Anybody uh, have anything? Sounds very I, I, I think we all have night. similar experiences uh, on it. It's, it's a big boon for consumers, but it's not perfect. No. All right. That's about it for this 41st edition of our Motor Week podcast. And let me see, we've got to thank our producer, Michelle Parker, our podcast creator, Bob Mixter, our audio engineer, Brad Giardello, and I know I just butchered his name again. I'll get it, Brad, I promise, one of these days. Thanks for everybody for making this podcast such a successful one. We hope you enjoyed listening to it, and we'll see you again here on Motor Week. You have been listening to the podcast of Motor Week, television's original automotive magazine. MotorWeek is made possible by Cars.com. For additional information on podcasts, videos, and showtimes, 
visit our website at motorweek.org. And watch MotorWeek, television's longest-running automotive magazine series, each week on your local PBS station.